Hey, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Armstrong, director of the MIT Energy Initiative. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, this afternoon's uh, seminar. We're really happy to have with us uh, this afternoon uh, Will, Choi, uh, Will Chu from uh, Stanford University. Uh, Will is an assistant professor of material science and engineering there. Um, he uh, is also a, a faculty fellow at the uh, Precourt Center uh, for Energy at Stanford. Uh, he has received his bachelor's in, in uh, physics from Caltech and also PhD and master's degree uh, from Caltech in material science. Um, at, uh, at Stanford, he's developed a large and very active group uh, looking at decarbonization pathways uh, as we transition the energy system. Uh, he's got some 30 researchers, I believe, uh, working uh, with him there, so very, very active um, in his research. Um, as you might not be surprised, uh, he's won quite a few awards on the way to this uh, very active program. Uh, he won the MRS Young Investigator Award. Uh, he has won Camille Dreyfus uh, Teacher Scholar uh, Award. Uh, he was recognized as one of the uh, 35, uh, under 35 top innovators by uh, Technology Review. Um, so he's got quite a set of honors. You can read more of them in the, uh, in, in the description of the seminar. But I don't want to take too much time away from, from your seminar. Uh, Will, it's great to have you here. Uh, look forward to your, to your talk, looking at uh, defective materials and their role uh, in the energy transition. Will? All right, Bob, thank you very much for the kind introduction and yes, for organizing the visit. And it's great to be here. I have uh, a lot of collaborators at MIT, many of them in this building, so this is great fun to be here. And um, as Bob introduced, I want to talk to you a little bit about two things, pathways toward decarbonization and the role of materials, specifically defective material. I'm a material scientist, so I'll give you the material science perspective. Um, to start, I thought I would establish the context, and I borrowed two slides from um, the joint visit to DC between uh, the Energy Initiative here and the Precourt Institute uh, at the Hoover Institution uh, in Capitol Hill. And this is a slide from Yet Ming that shows the key trends in electricity generation and storage. And probably what captures our attention is just the rapidly declining cost. For example, the cost of lithium ion battery for storage. And you look at also the cost of generation, both in terms of solar and wind. And this really poses two significant questions. In the area of transportation, what remaining R&D is necessary to fully electrify? We are on our way there, but we're very far from being there. And then on the electrical grid, can we somehow combine renewable generation, such as wind and solar, and storage, and compete with fossil purely on cost. So I'll try to circle back to this from a material scientist perspective. And beyond electricity storage and providing electricity for the grid, another important aspect is to use electricity as an input for the chemical industry. And this is a slide from Tom Jaramillo and Yugi uh, here in um, uh, chemistry looking at how to use electricity for synthesis. Top is one example. So aluminum is largely made via an electrochemical process. And this is a huge industry, more than $100 billion market. You make airplanes with it. Another industry is the core alkaline electrolysis. And this leads to more than 1,000 product. So if you have electricity that is low cost, and available all the time, you can start enabling things like transportation and the chemical industry. What are the challenges here? Well, if you take a look at the type of things you can make, you can begin to evaluate it looking at the net value per energy. So this is the dollar per kilowatt hour. So roughly where the green line is uh, will become our cost of electricity in the very near future, perhaps with storage. If you look at the two I've shown, aluminum and chloroalkali synthesis, they're above this line, so this is why they're being tackled. 
But if you look closer to it, there are a lot of fuels down here, ethanol, methanol, and so forth, that are not tackleable today. So the two questions here we have to ask is, well, can we start to look at the capital investment in the yield, which can be competitive with the conventional process or non-electrochemical based? And then perhaps more interestingly, can we envision a carbon negative synthetic pathway? So something that consumes carbon in the process of making fuels and other molecules. So to get at this, <clears throat> I want to offer my perspective on the grand challenge. To do all of these transformation with electricity, whether it's storage or chemical synthesis, you have to be able to control redox processes. So these are processes involving the change in the valence of material across many scales, both time and length. And this is one example for lithium ion batteries. So there are at least, uh, I don't know, 150 lithium ion battery in this room and many more in this building. You start at the cell level, which is watt hours, and you start to zoom in. And very quickly, you will reach down to the picowatt hour level, okay, and down to the atomic level. And this scale goes from device to electrodes to particles to atoms. And to be able to control all of these length scales is extraordinarily challenging. Not to mention the problem is not only length, but also time. So if you look from the left to the right, you have materials to devices to systems. So as a material scientist, we tend to live on the materials level. But in order to solve this challenge of mastering time and length scale for energy conversion process, we have to tackle each one of them. And in our toolbox, we have a lot of things. For example, we have synthetic and fabrication for every single length scale. We have characterization involving every single scale. And we also have modeling and data analysis approach. The challenge is how do you unify them, OK? And I'm going to point out two things that I think is very important. One aspect is going up. So if you pick any one of the scale and go up, this means going from picoseconds to years. And productly speaking, this is looking at degradation of materials. Ultimately, these energy transformation process, like batteries, have to last for years or a decade. And the fundamental process starts at the quantum mechanical level and goes all the way up to degradation over many years. And this is not very well understood. Likewise, to go from left to right, you have to think about scaling up. So how do we turn a material composition to a nanostructure to an assembly of structure to devices? And this is the science of scaling up. And these two aspects are the current challenges. So these are three things that I think are important for us to address at the higher level. One, we need to be able to unify across these time and length scale by embracing the fact that these processes are dynamical in nature, as I said, from picoseconds to years, and heterogeneous from nanometers to millimeters. We cannot ignore them. We have to somehow understand them. Two, because there are so many types of experiments, characterization theory we can do, we have to be able to integrate them so we can accelerate the innovation cycle. So it's basically walking up and down the slide I was showing before. And as I mentioned, we need to be able to tackle the issues of degradation and scaling up directly in a fundamental manner beyond just relentlessly optimizing it. Okay, so these are the three challenges I will touch upon today. The, the talk is short, but I'll try to give you a flavor of what we're trying to do uh, from a material science perspective to address these challenges. So let me just give a few slides, uh, show a couple of cool videos, uh, just to show the first point. How are we embracing dynamics and heterogeneity? So using batteries as an example, because we have many of them, this is a battery cell. And I'm taking it apart, so it's like a jelly roll, right? Like a sushi. And you unroll it, this is the picture you get. The gold color reflects the fact that the material here, which is carbon, is electrochromic. So when lithium goes into this material, which is part of the battery, it changes color. The top row is when the battery is new. The bottom is after degradation over about a seven-month period. So you can see part of the battery becomes deactivated. 
And this is the centimeter scale. So take a look at the skill bar here. This is the device level characterization. So it's highly heterogeneous and also takes many months for the heterogeneity to develop. Then you look in to one of these battery electrodes. This is the schematic of the picture here on the top left. That's a cross section. And each one of these particles you see consists of these particles. They're about 10 microns in size. And the color you're seeing are the mapping of lithium distribution in this material. So we went from 10 centimeter down to a few microns. And then again, being able to characterize the heterogeneous behavior of this material. You can see all these spots. This is where the lithiums are residing in this material as you charge and discharge the battery. Going down further, now we take that assembly of particles and look down on just one of the particles. Now you're down to the hundreds of nanometer length scale. And the color again represents the chemistry locally. So this is looking at, again, the insertion and removal of lithium. Highly heterogeneous. This is a work that's in collaboration with Martin Bazant uh, in chemical engineering here. And it doesn't stop here. The heterogeneity extends all the way to the atomic level. So now if you look at the scale bar two nanometers and look at within the crystal structure, it's also heterogeneous there. The material doesn't have the perfect crystal structure. It has actually a very atomically heterogeneous structure with atoms residing on the wrong position. So these are defects in the material. So this is just to give you a flavor that in order to understand and eventually control these redox process and to make the transformation more efficient, you have to embrace them. Okay? You have to be able to characterize them. You have to be able to control them. So for the rest of the talk today, I want to focus on just one of these length scale, which is material chemistry. So I want to talk about how the atomic arrangement of the material the local bonding environment could play into process that controls degradation. I'm going to show two examples. One will be in the area of energy storage, and the other one will be in the area of chemical synthesis. So let me get started by talking about defects. After all, that was the title of the talk. And in here, we are considering a crystalline solid. So these are materials with periodic arrangement of atoms. This is just a simple schematic of a two-dimensional lattice. That's the perfect material. Every single atom is repeated, is semi-infinite. But the real crystalline solid is finite, so it has surfaces. It has missing atoms. It has impurities. It has interstitials. It has missing roll of atom, so on and so forth. And this is the real solid. And traditionally, when we look at these defects, we think, uh-oh, this is going to be problematic. In solar cell, the dangling bonds near these defects causes electronic states to localize. And this could become a problem for charge transport and recombination, lowering the performance of solar cells. But as I will show, these defects indeed actually control the functionality, in some cases in a positive manner, in materials for electricity storage and batteries, and also in chemical synthesis as well. So let me get started with the first one in storage. What are the rules of defects, and how can we understand them and eventually make use of them? Where are we today? Batteries have come a long way. A lot of the innovation was done right here at MIT. These are two battery electric vehicles you can buy today, the Chevy Bolt and the Tesla Model 3. The prices are still a little bit steep, but it's come down a long way. What I want to point your attention to is both the cost of the battery system, but also the range. So 240 miles and 310 miles sounds quite a bit, but my favorite drive is to drive from San Francisco to LA. That's where my parents live. And I have to charge along the way in my Tesla Model 3. So even just 50 miles longer would be helpful. Uh, to get me all the way to LA in one charge. And secondly, you look at the cost. These are still quite far from cars like Camry, for example. So in order for us to go further on fully electrifying, the cost has to come down, the range has to go up. 
And these are two driving forces behind developing new materials for batteries. And I'll talk about why defects are important. So one of the key components of a lithium-ion battery, one of the reservoir of lithium, is typically a metal oxide. So this stores the low energy reservoir of lithium, typically some form of layered materials, as shown here. Layer materials are very good because the transport of lithium, which is in green here, can go fairly unimpeded. So if you maintain this layer structure, the transport property is excellent. But the problem is, after you use the material, it begins to disorder. Okay, so rather than maintaining this perfect structure, you have the metal ions and the lithium ions moving around. So what happens, you lose the perfect layer structure, and that causes your storage capacity to decrease. Furthermore, because you are inserting and removing lithium, you're also reducing and oxidizing the material. So as you remove a lot of lithium, you're actually putting the material in a very oxidized state. And eventually, from an electronic structure perspective, the Fermi level goes down so much, it begins to empty your non-bonding oxygen state. And this essentially destabilizes the oxygen, and the oxygen comes out. This is both a problem for performance, because you will start to further rearrange the material, and two, it becomes an oxygen source, which presents a safety hazard. On the top left, I'm showing you the theoretical capacity of many different types of material use for the cathodes of a lithium-ion battery, and also the practical capacity. So in blue is practical. So you can see the various chemistry, like lithium cobalt oxide, lithium nickel cobalt manganese oxide, and so forth. You're only using about 50 to 65% of what's available. And that is because I cannot remove all of the lithium in this material. Otherwise, the structure collapses and causes the rearrangement to occur. There's some hope. There is one class of material which I will touch upon, the very final one, this lithium uh, excess material here, in which the utilization can go to 75%. And you can see the blue bar is almost twice as high as the others. Another major driver is, as you go to less expensive batteries, you also have to think about using more abundant elements. So you go from a cobalt-rich composition to a nickel-rich composition to a manganese-rich composition. And the cost can go down up to a factor of four in raw materials. So these are driving forces behind thinking about how to stabilize this material. So two things. One, prevent the structural rearrangement. Prevent the oxygen from leaving this material as you remove the lithium, as you oxidize the material, and try to use more abundant materials along the way. So let me get into some specifics here on the material chemistry. So this is the perfect material, say lithium metal oxide. You have alternating layers of oxygen, metal, and lithium. And what I want is for the material to stay this way after I remove the lithium and I put the lithium back. This is how you get a reversible storage mechanism. One way that has attracted a lot of attention is to substitute some of the metal with more lithium. So this is called overstuffing of lithium. So some of the metal has been replaced with lithium. In the top example, the lithium to metal ratio is one to one. In the bottom, it's two to one. And the prevailing thought is that if you have this linear bond between oxygen and lithium, it actually keeps the oxygen intact. So this is the ionic bonding between lithium and oxygen. And this can somehow prevent the oxygen from leaving the material. And again, this would be necessary for preventing the rearrangement and the loss of the layer structure. So this has shown to be effective, but we don't understand how it works. Okay? This is being a very highly debated question in the field. In this material, we have achieved short-term stability, but in the long term, the atoms are still moving. But what is very interesting is you're not losing any of the energy capacity in the material. You can actually keep most of it. Let me show you a couple of interesting performance. This is what happens to the voltage curve of the battery versus the amount of lithium you're inserting and removing. So if you remove about, say, half of the lithium from this material, 
it's actually very reversible. But the capacity is fairly small. But if you were to charge up the battery all the way, you can double its capacity. But what you get is, you can see the voltage on the way back, it's very, very sluggish. So it becomes very hysteretic. An ideal battery should duplicate the curve as you charge and discharge it. But to give you a sense, this is where the Chevy Bolt and the Tesla lie. So we're performing about 40% higher in terms of capacity. So you're able to remove much more lithium. And you can cycle this battery hundreds of times. Now the industrial record is about 1,000 times. So this is approaching the performance of today's lithium-ion battery at a capacity that is significantly higher. But as you can see, there is still strong hysteresis and degradation. The integral of this curve is the energy output of the battery. So as the voltage keeps falling, the material is degrading. So we wanted to understand, one, what is happening in this battery material as you overstuff it with lithium? How does this lithium oxygen bond help stabilize the material? And then two, why is there still structural transformation? So what can we understand from this? So this is what I would consider the science of degradation in the system. So I'll give you one technical slide here, a little bit um, more in depth. So the question we have to ask here is, we are removing electrons from oxygen, which is not bonded to anything. So this, in principle, is very bad for any oxide. But yet, this material can continue to operate for many hundreds of cycles. So we have to ask the question, what is the redox chemistry happening? So in a standard battery, the transition metal will change oxidation state. Gaining and losing electron, that's how you're storing energy. In this material, apparently, we can also oxidize and reduce oxygen in a reversible manner. So I'm just going to show you a few plots here. This is basically looking at the single charge and discharge cycle of a battery, looking at where the electrons go. We use spectroscopy to see oxygen, nickel, cobalt, and manganese. And we actually find that huge capacity you get on the previous slide. It was actually due to the oxidation of oxygen. So we're able to oxidize oxygen, but without leaving the material. So this is quite unusual. Usually when you oxidize oxygen, it comes out as oxygen molecule, and this is highly undesirable. So we wanted to understand how we're able to perform redox chemistry beyond the transition metal. The advantage is obvious. If you can do this, that means you can get the extra capacity. And that's what we're seeing here, that you have extra capacity 40% beyond what is possible with the traditional material, simply by putting more lithium in. But what is not understood is why. And this is where the point defects come in. If you take one of these layer structure, okay, again, metal, oxygen, lithium layers, and you empty all of the lithium layer here. The top is the pristine material, so you also see holes in the metal layer. And that is because that's where the lithium used to sit in the lithium that we have overstuffed into the material. But that's not what happens in reality. What happens in reality is that some of the metals are happier if they sit in the lithium layer because they have almost the same atomic radius. So this is known as cation migration. So some of the metal, it could be nickel, manganese, or cobalt, will actually migrate from the transition metal layer into the lithium layer. So where the lithium is supposed to go. And you can already see here, this leads to a very interesting local environment inside the metal layer. So I'll introduce the defects more specifically in the next slide. But what I wanted to show you was, remember this extra capacity you're able to get. So this is the more charge you can put into the material, 40% more. The increase right here in the capacity you get, actually almost all of it comes from the oxidation of oxygen. But this is, shouldn't work. And the missing link is as the oxygen gets oxidized, the transition metal also moves simultaneously. Okay? So as you gain more capacity, these transition metal layers are coming down to the lithium layer simultaneously. So this is very unusual that they happen at the same time. And what we have done is to offer a very simple material chemistry explanation on why this happens.
This is the pristine material. So with all of the lithium removed, this is the top view and the side view. You have the vendor wall gap here that has no lithium. And here is what happens when one of those metal atoms decide not to stay in the metal layer, but rather move down to the lithium layer. So this creates two defects in the material. You're missing a lithium, a missing a metal atom in the metal layer. And two, you now have an extra atom in the lithium layer. So we call this a metal vacancy and a metal antisite. And the formation of this pair leads to a substantial change in the chemistry of the metal oxygen bond. On the left, the bonding between the metal and the oxygen with the oxygen in the center is doubly coordinated. So if you have taken coordination chemistry before, you know we typically put metal in the middle and we look at the ligands, which are the oxygen. But here you actually see the center is oxygen. This is before the metal moves out of the way. And this is what happens after the metal moves out of the way. The metal vacancy is formed. The oxygen dangles, right? Because no longer you have a metal atom there. These dangling atoms effectively render the oxygen atom is singly bonded to the metal. So you go from a doubly coordinated to a singly coordinated as you have this transition. And we've done quite a bit of theoretical calculation to understand what is going on. And it turns out what you're doing here is the concerted oxidation of oxygen and the transition metal migrating into an unhappy state. And together, this has a favorable energetics of about zero electron volt, which means it can happen at room temperature. And we computed, and we also experimentally measured the bond length. It goes from about two angstrom between the metal and the oxygen to about 1.6. Effectively, what you're doing is turning the single bond into a double bond. And this actually explains why you're able to do this. If you oxidize oxygen at the same time you move the transition metal and creating the metal vacancy and the antisite defect, you will turn the bond from a single to a double, effectively increasing the stability of the oxygen. And this is why we understood as how we're able to actually take electrons away from the oxygen without it wanting to come out as oxygen gas. And it's because it happens in, at the same time as the metal moving out of the way. So this is a very classical example of a cation vacancy connected to the redox process that we want to engineer, which is, can we get more capacity out of the battery? So the simple lesson here is, if you have the right type of defects, for example, a missing metal atom, you can substantially increase the stability of the oxygen while using it as an energy storage medium. So this is the first picture I want to show you. The second one I want to talk about is chemical synthesis. So we have seen how point defects, like metal vacancies, can substantially alter the capacity of materials for lithium and battery. I'm also going to show a very similar example for synthesis. And here, the synthesis question I would like to tackle is a carbon negative process. So can we turn CO2 into a reactant? So these are some dream situations. For example, you can take CO2 from the flue gas of a chemical plant, use that as an input in some sort of an electrochemical process in which the electricity is the input of the energy, and you dissociate CO2 into something like carbon monoxide. You dissociate water into hydrogen, and you combine that to make liquid fuel that can be used for transportation. This is essentially a recycling of carbon. And the second situation can also envision that somehow the CO2 can be brought back via air capture. This is challenging, but if this can be done, then you have a closed loop carbon neutral process. The challenge is how do you turn CO2 into something like carbon monoxide in a selective manner? And one particular technology we have been interested in is high temperature electrolysis. Uh, 
So this is different than aqueous or water-based electrolysis. And the reason it could be more useful is the energy carrier here is oxygen. So if you want to turn CO2 into CO, the easiest thing you can do is strip one oxygen away. Okay, so that's a simple chemistry. And you don't want to do this in water, because if you do it in water, you can form all sorts of intermediate product. There are a lot of species with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But if you do this by just deoxygenating the material, you can directly turn CO2 into CO, and potentially water into hydrogen as well. And you can do this in the electrolysis mode, but actually the reverse is already commercial, which is the fuel cell mode. So you can take oxygen on one side and take something like carbon monoxide or hydrogen and then do the reverse. And you're able then to make electricity from a fuel like hydrogen. And this can be done at very high current density. You can actually do this at several amps per square centimeter. You can do it in the electrolysis mode or the fuel cell mode. You can do it with hydrogen, you can do it with water, you can do it with CO, you can do it with CO2. The temperature is quite high. This is the current challenge of the material set. It takes about uh, 700 to 800 degrees Celsius to operate. But Bloom Energy, which was recently um, listed on NASDAQ, uh, has been commercializing the right-hand side, the fuel cell. And I think the opportunity could be the electrolysis side to turn CO2 into CO. As I alluded to earlier, the challenge is selectivity. So you might ask the question, well, sounds easy. CO2 to CO, just strip an oxygen atom off, you're all set. That's good. But the problem is you can strip either one or two oxygen. If you take one oxygen out, you get CO. If you get two oxygen out, you get carbon. So this is, by the way, great. If you can go to carbon, then you can just sequester it in carbon. But the problem is twofold. One, the potential for these two processes are very similar. They're only off by a little bit more than 100 millivolt, 100 millivolt. So it's very, very close. So you can get both of them at the same time. And then secondly, if you deposit carbon in an electrochemical cell, it's going to fracture your entire cell. This is the example from the University of Pennsylvania. On the left, it's a platinum-based electrode, which does not catalyze the second reaction, but only the first one. So the cell after reaction looks intact. But on the right, this is what happens when you do it on nickel, which is very good for the second reaction. It's also very good for the first reaction. So it's good at taking CO2, turning into CO, but it's also good at taking CO2, turning into carbon. And then you see this puff right here, that's carbon. So imagine that in your electrochemical cell, it will lead to an immediate failure. So the goal here is to develop the fundamental insight to engineer the defects so I can somehow destabilize or make the second reaction slower. And to address this question, you really should be able to watch the first, the two reactions happen in real time. So we have to be able to observe CO2 being dissociated into CO and as well CO2 being dissociated into carbon. And I would say, in the past 10 years, we have witnessed a tremendous innovation in characterization in material science to be able to see these reactions happen, to see the conversion of CO2 to CO and carbon. The challenge thus far has been managing both the sensitivity to the active site, so after all, this is catalysis, so that means you have to be sensitive to the first few layers of atoms. This is the y-axis of the plot. The x-axis is the gas pressure. So these reactions happen typically at one bar. If you have to go to vacuum, which is often what we do to make these measurements, then you're not operating in the real system. And there are many te techniques here, I won't get into the details, but they occupy either very surface sensitive by vacuum or less surface sensitive, but you can go to the high pressure. What you really want is the top corner here in which you're very sensitive to the active site but also can operate at high pressure. And that's what we've been developing in the past few years, is developing spectroscopy techniques using synchrotron radiation so we can directly probe the active site. So this is actually a really important technological breakthrough in characterization that allows us to watch these reactions as they happen and to monitor the behavior of defects. Essentially what we have done is taken one of these 
CO2 electrolysis cell, made a miniature version of it, and characterized it as we ran the cell. Let me show you the results. We compared three systems here. We wanted to observe and avoid carbon deposition. That's the goal. Okay, we want to go from CO2 to CO without going to carbon. The first example is showing you the catalyst that is good for both. Okay, this is nickel, okay? and you're able to make a lot of carbon, which is what's shown in the y-axis here, and you can do this at the equilibrium potential, so this is the thermodynamic expectation. That's the blue box there. So right at the expected potential, carbon shows up, and we see this using the operando experiment I mentioned. So this is no surprise. Nickel is very good for both. The second material, which has also been investigated a lot for the fuel cell reaction, but not for electrolysis, just for the fuel cell. So this is converting, say, CO to CO2 or hydrogen to water. There, the behavior is very different. So if we only have this material, so serum oxide, then you can operate the cell about 500 millivolt beyond its equilibrium and still get no carbon. So here, the blue line is where you expect the carbon to be deposited, so this is unwanted. But instead, you can push all the way south to 600 millivolt before carbon shows up. So this is highly desirable. But the problem here is that it's not very good for the first reaction, so the efficiency is low. So what people usually do is you take both and you put it together. And that's what we have done here, is to combine the nickel catalyst with the serum oxide catalyst, and you make a composite, and that's what's shown there. So there it's about halfway, so you can push beyond the equilibrium potential by about 200 millivolt, which means now you can operate your electrolysis cell without carbon deposition, making only carbon monoxide from CO2, which can subsequently be used in a process to synthesize carbon-containing fuel renewably, and you can operate it with 100% selectivity as long as you stay below this threshold. So this two picture shows you what is currently done and what may be possible. And we're trying to gain the fundamental insight through this characterization, and as I'll show next, also through modeling as well. So the great thing about being able to watch a reaction like this happen is record the dynamics. So we're able to follow as we apply a voltage to this electrolysis cell. As we step down the potential, we can actually monitor how the carbon is deposited in real time. So the x-axis here is time. So this is a great example of dynamic information. This is nickel, so all we see is basically carbon starts deposit at the equilibrium threshold. What was really exciting is to see what happens when you combine the nickel with the serum oxide catalyst together. There, the behavior is extremely different. First, you have more species. Not only do you have the carbon deposition at a lower potential, you also have a prevailing presence of carbonate. Okay? This is CO3 2 minus ions on the surface, and also at a higher potential, you have the carboxylate. So this is basically CO2 minus. To visualize this a bit, this is basically a CO3 molecule sitting on the surface, and this is a CO2 molecule sitting on the surface of this material. And what I'm going to show you is where this sit, there has to be a missing oxygen to begin with. Without the missing oxygen, none of these happen. And the reason why these species are important is when they are present, the carbon deposition is avoided. And to rationalize the set of dynamics, so we're observing as CO2 is being, as being dissociated into carbon monoxide and to carbon, we are using modeling to understand the reaction pathway to explain the set of data we have. So this is a plot showing you the sequential deoxygenation of the material. So you start with CO2, okay, you remove one oxygen, then you remove two oxygen. So here is basically CO2 gas. This is CO2 on the surface, CO on the surface, and then carbon on the surface. And the y-axis is the free energy at the temperature we are running the experiment at, which is about 700 degrees Celsius.
On the nickel, which is the one that does not give the good selectivity for carbon monoxide, but rather gives the undesired selectivity for carbon, you can see CO2 adsorption is very difficult, actually. CO2 doesn't even land because it has a two electron volt energy penalty. So how do you dissociate into carbon? It turns out you start with CO. And this is how it happens. You actually absorb from carbon monoxide, which is a product in the gas phase, and it's present in some amount. It will absorb under the surface and go directly to carbon. And in this material, carbon is very stable. If you have this particular crystallographic orientation 211 surface, carbon is almost as stable as graphite. So that's your, um, in your pencil. Okay? So you form carbon straight away. And this is why there is almost no barrier to forming carbon because you start from CO gas, you come down, you remove one oxygen, you get carbon, and it's almost all the way flat. So there's no energy barrier along the way. So this is not desirable. What we wanted to figure out is why the additive of serum oxide makes it so much better. So we then computed what happens on a serum oxide surface. Okay, so same process, starting with CO2, and then stepwise, removing oxygen from CO2 to CO to carbon. The first plot here shows you the energy landscape if no oxygen was missing from the surface. So this is the perfectly ideal material, no defects. You can see the energy pathway actually looks quite different than nickel already. So you still have very unfavorable CO2 adsorption, but you also have very unfavorable CO adsorption. But the bonus is that your energy is quite high for your carbon intermediate. So it doesn't like to deposit carbon because you have to go over here. But this is still not a desirable landscape because it's very flat. It means nothing will happen. Okay? But if you start to remove oxygen, so now this is removing one out of eight oxygen atoms from the surface. So now you have an oxygen deficient surface. Then you have the situation where the carbonate, which is this column here, becomes much more favorable. And this makes sense because you want that CO3 to minus atom to sit where the missing oxygen is in order to fulfill the better coordination. And if you continue to go down to different crystallographic orientation, at some point you encounter this particular arrangement, which is the 1-0 termination of this crystal. And you can see it's actually exactly the opposite of nickel. So rather than having an energetic barrier for CO2 to absorb onto the surface, which is the key reactant, it's actually downhill by almost one electron volt. Okay, this is the free energy. So that means there will be a lot of carbonate on the surface, and that's exactly what we see experimentally. We see a lot of CO2 uh, carbonate on the surface. And then secondly, you see after you get down here, it's all uphill. It's uphill to make CO, and it's furthermore uphill to make carbon atoms. And the energy barrier you have to pay to turn CO2 into carbon is this two steps uphill. And that's nearly two electron volts. So this is very challenging. But to make CO, the barrier is only one electron volt. So essentially what you're doing here is using an oxygen deficient surface. You coordinate the carbon carbonate adsorbate much better. You stabilize it in contrast to the metal surface because you can't form the bond on nickel. You stabilize that, then you increase the relative barrier going to the carbon product. And this is why we can't deposit carbon on Syria. And furthermore, if you join the two material together, what happens is this carbonate can then oxidize the carbon that's generated here it becomes an oxygen source locally because you have an abundance of oxygenated carbon. And this is how the material functions. So we're very excited to see this because in the past, it hasn't been possible to follow the reaction pathway of turning CO2 to CO and avoiding carbon deposition. But by combining the operandal characterization with the theoretical calculation, we're gaining some insight into the energetic landscape of turning CO2 into CO selectively. And to mention this one more time, the key is the missing oxygen on the surface. So you see this, there's a missing oxygen right there. 
and that's what's allowing the CO3 2 minus the carbonate to form in a very stable manner. And this is the key design rule is you have to trap the carbon in the form of an oxidized carbon. You don't want it to trap as carbon, then that's how you get the poor selectivity. Can we turn this into something useful? Absolutely. So we actually made a relevant size electrolyzer, 16 square centimeter. This is not something you do every day. Uh, this is in, done in collaboration with my colleagues at the Denmark Technical University, uh, in collaboration with Howder Topsol, the catalysis company. And we can actually make an operating electrolysis cell containing both just nickel and nickel and cerium oxide. And this is the data. This is the overpotential, so this is how much voltage you're applying, versus the conversion to CO. So you want the conversion to CO to be as high as possible. If you only use nickel, basically when you go beyond 70% conversion, the device dies. Because you're depositing carbon, it's literally ripping the electrochemical cell apart. But if you do it with the serum oxide being added, the abundance of the carbonate traps the carbon in the oxidized state, preventing it to go to carbon, and also decomposes any carbon that forms by oxidizing it. And then you can run it basically at close to 100% conversion. So this is actually quite remarkable because with just one missing oxygen atom, and by changing nickel to an oxide, you can stabilize the selectivity to nearly 100%. So this is the conclusion of my talk. So earlier I showed the slide on managing and spanning length and time scale. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to get into the other length and time scale. But hopefully you get a sense of how we can understand degradation in particular, in both the sense of highly selective chemical process and also a battery that can keep holding on to its oxygen. Let me offer a few take home messages in a broad context. Hopefully I've shown you that harnessing this low cost yet intermittent electricity from wind and solar is key toward decarbonization. I think everyone will agree on this point. For as a material scientist, if we want to be able to engineer these materials, we have to develop insights across time and length scale. And this will be key toward rationalized uh, rationalize engineering of these materials and devices. Defects, specifically the atomic defects I've talked about, are crucial for functionality in terms of stability, activity, and selectivity. And this is becoming a very interesting knob because now you can think about the local chemistry around these missing atoms or extra atoms. And these local chemistry can have substantial impact. And there are powerful knobs to two materials. So with that, I would just quickly acknowledge those who have contributed to work. Those highlighted in uh, red here are students and postdocs who contributed. And this is a really large uh, collaboration involving folks from Berkeley, Slack, industry, Denmark Technical University. And here are our funding sources. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. So we have time for questions. Um, we'll start in the back. Do you want to cycle a microphone around? Or yeah, is, is that my, we do, yeah, okay, one. good. <clears throat> hey, Will. Um, I was wondering, um, could you elaborate? <laughs> yeah, how are you? <laughs> yeah, so I would like to elaborate, uh, uh, I would like to ask you to elaborate a little bit more about how the surface facet of the serum oxide influences the bifurcation between carbon monoxide and uh, carbon atom production. Yeah, the simple answer is just related with the packing of atoms on those surfaces, right? So then you're going from a loosely packed to a densely packed, so the effect on the coordination is different. So it's really just a simple matter of that. So it's, it's the relative stabilization of the carbonate relative to the um, uh, carbon monoxide, right? Yes. Okay. So it's really what you want is this well to be deep, but not too deep. Mm -hmm. Because if it's too deep, it can't come off a CO. But you also want it to be deep relative to the carbon. And that's the key. And then there's a kinetic aspect to it. The deeper it is, the more coverage you will have. And the more carbonate you have, the more oxygen you have around the surface to remove any carbon that you might deposit transiently. And I didn't show this. It's actually really neat data in the transient data. So you can see here, 
as the carbon peak comes up, you actually see a small presence of the carboxylate, which is weird, but that's telling you actually the carbonate is reacting with the carbon to make the carboxylate. So this is called the reverse Bourdais reaction. So you're actually consuming the carbon in the process of doing this. Thank you. Got a question over here. Thank you. I was wondering, what are you planning to do with the carbon monoxide after you generate it successfully? I think once you have carbon monoxide, there is a wide range of process you can do. The, so the simple answer might be some sort of Fischer-Tropsch reaction to then further process that into a liquid fuel. But once you have a, say for example, a renewably generated carbon monoxide from a reuse of CO2, then really you open up a range of chemistry you can do. So if you have hydrogen, you have CO, pretty much anything can follow after that. So I think it's powerful to have CO uh, because hydrogenation of CO2 directly is challenging, right? So if you can actually help it, and then the situation here is just because the double bond between carbon and oxygen and CO2 is hard to activate. So what we're demonstrating here is a near 100% efficient process to make CO from CO2 without going to carbon. And I think this is one of the more important steps needed to make carbon-containing fuel for transportation, for aviation, uh, for sea freight, for example. Those will still rely very heavily on liquid fuel rather than, say, something like hydrogen or electricity directly. Good. Other questions? So defects are, of course, important. Uh, I wonder, do you have a good research strategy how to understand what to do, what defects to generate to, to find new futures and so on? Yeah, I think this is very important. So what you want is the defect you intend to have, you want to keep it there, right? So for a lot of these process, like the batteries example, the materials are processed at much higher temperature than they're used. So it is possible to generate the defect thermally and then to freeze it into the material. So that's what we're exploring, actually. So if you look at some of the ideas I mentioned here, in terms of these metal vacancy, they can actually be generated also thermally as well. So if I can generate them ahead of time, then I can begin to modify the property. So you can deviate from equilibrium. And the other aspect is by understanding the defects, you can also think about changing the composition of the material for example, this defect formation energy is very contingent upon which metal you have. So if you understand the defect formation energetics, then you can maybe choose your composition to create this type of favorable defects. In this case, you want this defect so you can hold on to the oxygen. So I would say the short answer is you can go through processing, but you have to keep it there. So this relies on the meta stability of these defects under the temperature, for example, you're operating your device. But you can also think of crazy way substitution and other compositional methods for keeping the defects. Um, yes. uh, yeah, very cool talk. Uh, I had a question about your ambient XPS. Um, I was one, so I think the main conclusion that you drew in the first part uh, was how, uh, what, what potential uh, you start to form carbon on the nickel. Yes. Um, but I was wondering, do you actually need the ambient XPS? Can you just polarize your material at different potentials and just analyze it post-reaction? Um, I mean, that is much easier, but I, yeah. Um, I think the answer is yes. You can certainly go to a potential, core it down, take a look at with the SCM to see if there's carbon. But to get this many data points will take quite a while. And then secondly, I think you will not be able to get the transient. This is really the key. Because in order to formulate our reaction pathway, we needed to know this entire curve here. So for example, if you just want to see carbon, that will stay. But the carbonate or the carboxylate, those will dissolve as soon as you cool down. So the ability to see it as it happens is key. I think this is the challenge. Mm -hmm. But you're right, just looking for carbon is pretty straightforward. But looking for these reaction intermediate, and this is why we knew that the model is probably correct because we can predict the stability of these intermediate species. And they are the key, right? They are the key to avoiding carbon from depositing because we're trapping the carbon in carbonate, if that makes sense. So I think that the short answer is yes, you can do it without the in situ approach. But having the dynamical aspect of materials just speeds up the understanding process very much so. 
Is there any complication coming from the high temperature when doing the XPS? Maybe it's just OK. So these reactions in the electrochemical cell runs practically about 700 degrees Celsius. So in this case, we also ran our in situ experiment at the same temperature. And the reason is because as you change the temperature, then the absorption free energy changes accordingly. So it's important to be at the temperature you're interested in. The only drawback is that we weren't able to use a very high pressure. So the pressure was only about uh, a, a few millibars, under a millibar. So it's still very far from the one bar. So it's getting closer, but not quite there. So there is still a gap. But I think this is a lot better than doing this in vacuum. You mentioned um, being able to reduce or pr uh, prevent structural rearrangements during lithium intercalation. Could you mention other ways of doing that besides overstuffing with lithium? Maybe I just missed the other methods. Yeah, so there are many ways to do it um, to avoid the rearrangement. So people have thought of, for example, putting additional atoms in the layer something that doesn't go away, like aluminum, for example, to keep the layer open. So that's one strategy. Um, but largely because the structure arrangement happens in concert with the oxidation of the atoms. So the simple chemistry explanation is all of these things happen because you're putting the transition metal in a very oxidized state, and it's trying to stabilize itself. And the way it stabilizes is by creating these dangling oxygen. So there may be actually very few ways to escape from this pathway. So what this is telling us is that structure rearrangement must come with the additional oxidation. Because that's the only way the oxygen can stabilize. It's either this or the oxygen leaves. But what is very interesting about this material is the metal can go back. So as we reduce the material, as we discharge it, then the metal actually goes back to the left situation. So it does so in a reversible manner. So I skip over this a little bit. That's what this curve shows. The transition metal actually goes up, and it comes back. So it can do so semi-reversibly. So this speaks to the ability for the structure to accommodate the cation motion. right? So we rather have it being reversible rather than irreversible in this case. But the short answer is there are other ways to do it, but you're fighting thermodynamics here because the atoms want to be undercoordinated in order to strengthen the bond. It's a, either this or the oxygen comes out. Thank you for a very nice talk. I was wondering about introducing these uh, deficiencies. Can you comment on uh, about the mechanical stability after introducing this? Because they can be like, we can initiate like crack propagation on these points and on what area, like in terms of the concentration, when it is like, can you comment? Yeah, I think this is generally true for introducing point defects in system is that the lattice constant will change. So this is inevitable. Um, these materials are relatively hard. So expansion and shrinkage is certainly a concern. So I, I think this is the problem. But the good thing about batteries is it already undergoes quite a bit of volume change as you remove an instant of lithium. So this is not much more than that. So you can imagine when you go from an empty layer to a full layer, let's see that right here. So as you go from this to this, there's already you know, several percent change in the lattice constant, even if the material doesn't rearrange itself. So that you have to live with, because we want to get the lithium in and out of the system. So. I would say it's an effect, but it's probably a small delta on top of a large expansion already. But this is something that we have to address in the material. So your phone in the carbon electrode expands by almost 10%. But you can do this several thousand times over. Hey, so I imagine that the cathode, the lithium-rich cathode still show capacity fade over time. If the cation disorder is reversible, then what's the irreversible? Thing in your opinion that leads to a capacity fade, or does it not fade at all? Yeah, so the capacity fade is actually really small. So if you look at between the second and the 500th cycle, it's only about 5%, which is actually pretty remarkable. Okay, um, That probably comes from some small um, loss of lithium or transition metal in the system. Right? So you're losing the lithium or transition metal inventory. 
That's possible. But we're pretty encouraged by the fact that the capacity is not decreasing overall. So overall, it's still utilizable. Is that the voltage is getting lower and lower, and that impacts your energy density of the system. Or the oxygen is slowly leaving the material, say over thousands of hours, and that's entirely possible as well. Yes, one more question here. Something I didn't oh, hold on to the understand mic. about the material is you were talking about. Sorry. Something I didn't completely understand about the material was that you said that the oxides were being oxidized to form these double bond structures. Mm -hmm. uh, but so that would probably only occur after you've already ejected most or all of the lithium. And so are you considering this as like extra capa mm -hmm. uh, capacity on top of lithium discharge? Like mm -hmm. how much lithium is in the material when you're observing these defects? This is an excellent question. So I'll direct you to this plot here. So the ejection, right, of these, um, the transition metal migration happens right around here. Okay, so maybe I can show this one here. Oh, I okay. see. Okay, so when you remove about 0.5 formula units of lithium from this material, the transition metal begins to move and the oxygen is oxidized. So it's this second half here on the right that's coming from the oxidation of oxygen. This is important because if you can't oxidize oxygen, all you get is about 150 milliamp hour per gram in this material, which is nothing to write home about. But it's this extra 150 you're getting that's amazing, and that comes from the simultaneous occurrence of oxygen getting oxidized, but also the transition metal moving, because if it doesn't move, then this will likely just come off as oxygen and you can't cycle it back because you've permanently lost the oxygen. So it's really the simultaneous occurrence and the stabilization by forming the cation vacancy, which is really quite interesting, as a beneficial defect in this material. I see. Thank you so much. Okay, if you would, uh, please join me in thanking Will for a great seminar.